Welcome to St. Ignatius Chapel. Today we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Ordinary Time. Our celebrant today is Jesuit Father Russell Pollitt. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Welcome as we come together to celebrate this fourth Sunday of the year. Jesus speaks bold and prophetic words in the gospel that people don't like. So the times perhaps we have heard words that we don't want to hear, words that have stretched us and we've been resistant, let's ask the Lord for the courage to be open so that we can hear those words that help us grow. Lord Jesus, your Son of God and Son of Mary, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, your Word made flesh and splendor of the Father, Christ have, mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and Amen. on earth peace, peace to people of good will. We praise you. you. We bless you. you. We adore yeah. you. We glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, you Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And let us pray. Grant us, Lord our God, that we may honor you with all our mind and love everyone in truth of heart. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. In the days of Josiah, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But you, gird up your loins, arise, and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its princes, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My mouth will tell of your salvation, Lord. My mouth will tell of your salvation, Lord. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me, free me, incline your ear to me and save me. My mouth will tell of your salvation, Lord. Be my rock my constant refuge, a mighty stronghold to save me. For you are my rock, my stronghold, 
My God, free me from the hand of the wicked. My, My mouth, mouth will tell, tell of your salvation, Lord. Lord. It is you, O Lord, who are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. On you I have leaned from my birth. From my mother's womb you have been my help. My mouth will tell of your salvation, Lord. My mouth will tell of your justice and all the day long of your salvation. O God, you have taught me from my youth and I proclaim your wonders still. My mouth, My mouth will, will tell, tell of your salvation, Lord. A reading from the first Corinthians. Earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is perfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, love, abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus began to say in the synagogue, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him 
and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do ye also in your own country. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine all over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and put him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down headlong. But passing through the midst of them, he went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke in the synagogue at the beginning of the gospel, we are told he wins the approval of all, and they were astonished at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. One could say he had them eating out of his hand. And then all of a sudden, things seemed to go pear-shaped. But notice what causes this change in mood and attitude towards Jesus. Jesus makes two historical, scriptural references about two situations, ones his hearers would have been acquainted with. I won't ask you as a test where those stories are to be found in the scriptures. Both refer to someone who is outside. First, a widow in the book of Kings, and then a leper. And both were miraculously cured by God through Elijah in the first instance and Elisha in the second. These God cared for, one could say, people were not Jews and they did not live in Israel. The widow and Naaman the leper were externs, they were foreigners, they were considered outsiders. They were excluded in the narrow minds of their listeners. That synagogue congregation knew exactly what Jesus was saying by making these references. Jesus was telling them that faith, rather than familiarity or belonging to the tribe or the institution was required for God to act. And he claims that they did not have faith, and therefore they could not receive what he had to offer them. Maybe Jesus got what he deserved from his former neighbors, because, quite frankly, he seems to insult them, and so they want to get rid of him. Another way of understanding this text, perhaps, is to say from our own experience that this homeboy comes back home and they think to themselves, what a blessing he is to us and our town. Aren't we honored to have him as one of our own? Then they begin to talk in the bars and in the kitchens, in the shops around town. They gossip, they ask themselves questions, why did he perform a miracle in Cana? Why did he heal people in Capernaum? Charity begins here at home, and he's done nothing for us here in this village. Why does he welcome and defend strangers? He should really change his attitude towards us. Think of the never-ending back and forth about migrants 
and refugees in our own times? How many leaders and politicians and governments don't take the same attitude as Jesus' fellow villagers? Keep them out. Do something for your own clan first. We all react to messages that we don't want to hear, the ones that make us feel awkward or point to our own insecurities or sometimes even show up our dishonesty. Jesus, like the prophet Jeremiah we heard in the first reading, had a message that his own people found hard to accept, so hard that they eventually say they want to kill him. We know all too well of people in this very country whose message was too hard to accept. People who were killed because of what they said and what they stood for. Just recently, everybody knows the story of the whistleblower Babita Dear Karan, who was murdered in South Africa. Our history is littered with such people. But I wonder what these texts teach us today. And the first thing I want to suggest is that they tell us that religion can bring out the best in us, but also the worst in us. There are countless examples of this, that religion can often have the opposite effect to what we think it should have. It can make us narrow, it can make us rigid, bigoted, judgmental, fundamentalist, and even more prone to attacking others and being intolerant. Religion can so easily be distorted and turned into something which is repulsive and fanatical. Religion, and this is the view of many secularists, can become synonymous with narrow-mindedness, with small-heartedness, intolerance, and power and money-hungry people. On the other hand, religion too can make us more tolerant and loving. Religion can truly liberate our hearts and minds and foster harmony in relationships. And so we have to get that open-minded balance that permeates true religion. St. Paul tells us in that second reading you heard today that there are three things that last, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. In other words, when we are more faithful, when we are more hopeful, when we are more loving, we are in tune with what God intends and therefore what religion is all about. Anything that diminishes our faith, our hope, and our love cannot be from God. I wonder Today, if you had to ask yourself, what does religion bring out in me, what your answer would be, does it lead me to greater love? The second invitation, I think, is something about courage, which is at the heart of deeply rooted faith. Both Jeremiah and Jesus are motivated by love, and they are therefore courageous. Even though the people didn't like what Jeremiah said, he continued to say what he was saying. Even though the people of Nazareth didn't like what Jesus said, he continued to say what he wanted to say. You see, to live a life of faith is to be deeply rooted and therefore emboldened, therefore courageous, motivated by love when we have opportunities to speak out, to say things maybe that our families and contemporaries do not want to hear, yet we know we have to say it because it is the right thing to say. Sometimes, like Jeremiah, we have to speak them publicly, and other times, like Jesus, we have to speak them to those who are familiar to us, those in our households and in our church community. Are you courageous enough to speak out or do you simply just accept the status quo for the sake of going on? Do you take the path 
of least resistance at work, in your family, and in your social life? Or can you, because you are deeply rooted, courageously speak the truth that lies in your heart? The third and final thing perhaps we can reflect on today is that for both Jesus and Jeremiah, the common good is at the heart of their mission. Notice how Jesus always speaks in terms of people and not ideas. He talks about setting the downtrodden free. He speaks about liberty for captives. We live in a culture of individualism, which in a strange way is a contradiction in terms, because culture is that which we wish to pass on to other generations, to transmit to those who follow us. It is indeed to continue and advance the group or the community. Individualism has little concern for the common good or for those who follow, except for how the individual can be advanced. The spirit or this mindset is so much part of our daily experience. Like the air that we breathe, we can begin to assume that this too is good. And it seems to me that Jesus and Jeremiah are inviting us to change that basic self-centered question into one that is other-centered. Not what is in it for me, but what is in it for others. And therefore, what is in it for us? Jesus insulted his neighbors by what he said and what he did. Because Jesus called them away from their individualistic way of seeing things, their self-centered way of seeing things, to being other-centered, to journey alongside and beside others. What we hear in today's gospel is at the heart of the Christian mission. We might ask ourselves how we serve the common good, how we teach our children and our young people about the common good, rather than the advancement of the individual. How do I advance the common good rather than simply just myself? Finally, the gospel tells us that Jesus passed through the midst of them. Quite a James Bond, quite move when he uh, is going to be thrown off that cliff. I wonder if the invitation that Jesus offers us passes through the midst of us or if we allow true faith to bring out the best in us so that we too can be courageous in seeking to uphold the common good and therefore all our good. Let's pray together now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's now bring our prayers before the Lord. For the grace of discernment in our church, that we may understand the signs of the times and recognize God's presence, action, and invitation each day, and by doing so, respond wholeheartedly 
to God. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For courage, that all God's people would not be afraid to live the values we profess, and in so doing, transform our world by our faith, hope, and love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For leaders of government, that God will give them an understanding of the critical needs of those whom they serve, and courage and wisdom to address them so that the common good is upheld. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the prophets of today, who challenge all humanity to seek God first and love God and God's vision for the world before all else, that they may have divine help in the spreading the message of justice and truth when there is resistance to them. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For all who are downtrodden and have little hope, that God will open new opportunities for those who lack education, employment, health care, or safe housing, and help them to move forward into freedom and tranquility. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord our God, we humbly offer you these prayers. We know that you answer them as you know best through Christ Jesus, your Son, and our risen Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread to offer, fruit of the earth and work of our human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, work of our human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Let's pray, sisters and brothers, that our sacrifice and the sacrifice and efforts of our lives may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and the good of the Holy Church. O Lord, we bring to your altar these offerings of our service. Be pleased to receive them, we pray, and transform them into the sacrament of our redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the Word through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin. Fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so with angels and all the saints, we declare your glory as with one voice we acclaim. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You're indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. And giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the cup, and once more giving thanks, he gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by your Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Butti, our Bishop, and all the clergy, and all who minister to your people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with St. Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray now, as the Lord himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil and graciously grant peace in our days. That by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the for kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take you away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold Jesus, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. How blessed are we who are called to share in the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord. I am not worthy that you should enter into my life, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The body and blood of Christ bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Although you cannot receive physical communion with us now, we invite you into a moment of spiritual communion. The great medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, defines spiritual communion as an ardent desire to receive Jesus in the Holy Sacrament 
and a loving embrace as though we had already received him. His words are echoed by the great mystic and fellow doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, who wrote, When you do not receive communion and do not attend Mass, you can make a spiritual communion, which is a most beneficial practice. By it, the love of God will be greatly impressed on you. At this moment, we invite you to focus on Christ and your longing for union with Him. Express your desire to feel His grace coursing through you, giving you strength and courage, particularly in these difficult times. In your desiring union, you are united with us and to Christ. In this moment, we experience the reality that is already here. Let us pray. Nourished by these redeeming gifts, we pray, O Lord, that through this help to eternal salvation, true faith may ever increase. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve God by loving and serving one another. Thanks be to God.